George, you initially said that you thought the Supreme Court would have a difficult time. Your quote that I looked up today was, avoiding the consequence of the plain language of the 14th Amendment. It was obviously a 9-0 call today. So I wonder, you know, what you made of this ruling and if you feel differently I, now. I, I think I, no, I don't feel differently. I think they did have a very difficult time with it because I don't think any of the three opinions make any sense whatsoever. I think these opinions are fundamentally incoherent and they're fundamentally arbitrary. And I think that, uh, I, I think it just shows the difficulty the court had in trying to select an off-ramp here. I mean, they totally rejected the Trump, Trump's principal arguments, which were that, that the president is somehow not an officer of the United States, and the other argument, which was that he did not engage in an insurrection. And the latter, I think, is the most important takeaway from this, uh, notwithstanding Donald Trump declaring victory. He remains, an adjudicated insurrectionist after this opinion because the, the Supreme Court did not in any way undercut or, or contradict or suggest in any way there was any infirmity in, in the factual findings made by the lower courts. Why do you think that was? Because <laughs> because he's unquestionably an insurrectionist. There really wasn't, I mean, it would have been absurd for the court to try to redefine uh, what it means to engage in an insurrection and to engage and, and, and what an insurrection is uh, to try to fit it to, 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 to get Donald Trump off the hook. And that's what the, that, that's what the court was terrified about. They didn't want to go there. And, and, and you can see the sort of the terror in the opinions, in the concurring opinions. I mean, just as Barrett was just, uh, you know, it just, her opinion just exuded fear of the political consequences of the decision. And frankly, the, dis the concurring opinion, I know they, they, you know, they're perceived as having attacked the majority opinion for going too far, but the problem was it wasn't overreach by the majority, it was underreach by all nine justices. And the, and the concurring opinion, frankly, um, you know, its criticisms of the majority opinion uh, actually end up undermining the concurrence's own opinion as to, as, to the, as to the result in the case, which was to affirm. Well, that's interesting so. because I wonder then what you made of this line because of what the liberal justices said about the majority that stood out to me where they said, quote, they decide novel constitutional questions to insulate this court and the petitioner from future controversy. I don't, honestly, I cannot figure out exactly what they are talking about there. And it may be a circumstance where the opinions were so quickly written that some of that language is held over from, was, was held over from an earlier draft of the opinion. As far as I can see, what the majority held was that states cannot enforce, state, whether it be state officials or state courts, cannot enforce Section 4. 14, uh, section 3 of the 14th Amendment against any person running for federal office and the basis for that uh, without a congressional enactment. I don't think there's anything in that opinion that actually holds, and there couldn't be because it's not, it wasn't presented by the case, that there is, that, that somehow uh, insurrectionists are completely immunized uh, from, from any kind of, of federal action to apply Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. I just don't see it in the majority opinion. And maybe it was there in a draft, I don't know. But I can't make heads or tails, frankly, out of the concurring opinions any more than I can make heads or tails out of the majority opinion. It's just, yeah, and the it was just all opinions, shoddy legal work all around by all the justices. Yeah, the concurring opinions are, are, are definitely worth reading. But there was also this moment today where Trump was scheduled to give remarks right after this came out. His team you know, had a pretty good idea of what was coming when the Supreme Court said they were going to announce an opinion today. And, and, you know, I think the idea was that he was going to be touting this victory, but he ended up spending more time defending his immunity case. Here's part of what he said today. Another thing that will be coming up very soon will be immunity for a president, and not immunity for me, but for any president. If a president doesn't have full immunity, you really don't have a president because nobody that is serving in that office will have the courage to make, in many cases, what would be the right decision or it could be the wrong decision. You know, you heard between that and what he said earlier, praising the court for its brilliant and diligent work. I mean, how much do you expect that would change from today, what he said, to what we could hear as soon as maybe June 
uh, on how I they don't rule think, on immunity. Uh, look, I, I don't think he's going to be a happy camper in May or June whenever the immunity case comes down, because I think uh, this court, which was clearly motivated by fear of applying the law, is going to be a fearful of not applying the law in the immunity case because it would be such a horrible and terrible decision. I think there's no legal expert feels otherwise that to, to, to suggest that the president has the kind of absolute immunity from criminal con, from criminal prosecution that Trump asks for. And it may be true that there are some circumstances, hypothetical ones, where Congress could pass a law that's designed to infringe upon the, uh, upon the president's ability to carry out his office offices and use a criminal sanction to do that. But that's just not this case. This is a case where the president tried to extend his term of office and, and violate the very clause of the Constitution, the executive vesting clause that says he has the executive power, and it, but he only has it for four years. And, and it's just, if the, if the president can't be prosecuted here, then he can never be prosecuted. And it's got nothing to do, as Trump suggests, with the president having courage to do the right thing on the behalf of the country. Because he wasn't trying to do the right thing on behalf of the country. He was trying to do the wrong thing uh, for the country, but for his own personal benefit. Yeah, he claimed today that the presidency would become a, a ceremonial position without that immunity. We'll see what they decide. George Conway, we will bring you back, certainly when that decision happens. Thank you. Thank you for that.